We're at Purple Door in 2010 with Derek Webb. Nice to have you. 15th anniversary of the Purple Door Festival. Oh, I didn't realize. Isn't that pretty cool? It's amazing. Well done. Thanks. I guess. <laughs> so what have you been up to lately? I know Cayman's Call has new stuff coming out. I know you've been touring. All kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, um, Cademan's has a record that's coming out in a, in a couple of months, maybe. Um, and are you doing anything for that? I produced the record. Okay, so that's a lot. And, and I mean, Cademan's is, um, I mean, the band started in 92. I was with them for about 10 years. I've been out for almost 10 years. And, but Cademan's, as it turns out, is very much like Hotel California, in that several of us over the years have tried to leave, but none of us really successfully. And so we keep coming back to do projects together, probably just because we're family, I mean, we just, we grew up together, I mean, all these people, and so we keep finding reasons to hang out, um, and so we, because we did a record last year and two of that, that was uh, overdressed, and then this year we have this new one's called Raising Up the Dead, and that's, I don't know if there's going to be any touring to speak of, but we, we did this record together and I produced it, and we, and it's, I really think it's their finest piece of work, I mean, these guys really, there's some unbelievable creativity coming out of this group of people right now, and I'm so, like, honored to be able to be the one with the net trying to catch it all. It's a great project. So when you talk about incredible creativity, are, like, is this lyrically? Is it musically? Are they, what kind it's of? It's just everything. I mean, there, there are there are. I, I've told some some of my friends that I feel like this new one, Raising the Dead, is maybe the the first real Cadence Call record after 18 years. And the reason is because over the years, like I had written about half the songs, and this guy Aaron Tate had written about half the songs. He was not in the band, though. He was a friend of the band. And so several of the singers in the band were never singing songs they'd written, like Cliff and Danielle. You know, right. I was right singing my songs. but And on this record, for the first time ever, um, only members of the actual band wrote the songs, and almost every member of the band contributed to the writing. I mean, it's the most collaborative thing the band's ever done, so you're getting more sense of the personalities of these individual members than anything the band's ever done. Todd Bragg, the band's drummer, wrote a song. Jeff Miller, the band's bass player, wrote, wrote two songs. Cliff Young, who'd never written a song in his life, wrote a couple of the songs. Danielle, who just kind of stood up there and sang, you know, quietly for most of the band's, you know, career, wrote the vast majority. She wrote six or seven songs. This is her record. I mean, she's like, she in particular is in kind of a, a season of like creative renaissance right now. And it's just an odd thing when a band is out of kind of commercial spotlight and there's no real pressure no one's like finding their identity in this anymore or making their full-time living at this anymore the cadence all of a sudden it liberates everybody to, to potentially do their best work so everyone's just emoting and creating and everybody got caught up in the energy of it and then this just magical kind of special thing happened and this record got made i mean it, it really is just like that that's amazing and i don't think we saw it coming that something so uh so great from cadence call was about to happen. None of us saw it coming. In fact, the band, I mean, had really, unfortunately, because of label pressure where they had been before, they're on a new label now, but um, had really been at the end of a string of kind of poor creative decisions in the last year or so. I mean, like, over some years. And so the band's fans who were left, you know, had pretty low expectations. I mean, it's, you know, they, it's, it's, it's been a rough creative season the last so many years for Cavemans. Not because they're not you know, brilliant people, just because that's the reality sometimes of a band on the back end of success with no real label support. Um, they're just trying to make any money they can off the band and, and put pressure on them to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. And when the band once got free of that, all of a sudden they found that they had bottled up all this incredible creativity waiting to come out. And, and I got to like witness it and try to capture it. So I'm so happy to hear, I'm really happy to hear that. I can't imagine how and I wrote with them. I mean, we all wrote together, you know, like I wrote a couple songs and I co-wrote with everybody in the band. We all like got together and wrote this thing. And there was no consideration of who's going to buy it, how they're going to market it. We need stuff for radio. Literally none of that. We were like, we want to make the coolest record we can possibly. And it doesn't matter how many sell. It doesn't matter if anybody hears it. Because there is that possibility at this point because Cademan's you know, fans are a little scattered. But I think this record may be good enough to unite those people again. I hope so. Well, we'll see what happens. I hope people hear it because I think it might be their best. Well, what about you? That's what Cade Menz is up to. What are you writing about? What are you up to? Um, I'm working on a record right now that's called Feedback, and it's, um, I'm calling it a worship project. Wow. Um, but if anybody knows my typical MO, they'll know that just to not jump ship too fast when you, because some people hear that and they um, 
they, they have certain uh, ideas that pop into their head about what that would probably be. And whatever it is you're thinking, it's not that. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think that, of... That, that's all I'm going to say. What right we now. know of Derek Webb, what we know of worship, and... Because yeah. it's really not what I do, mm. but I just had this idea, this thing I wanted to do all of a sudden while I was touring Stockholm and... Um, Stockholm Syndrome, not... not right. The, the physical place. <laughs> uh, I've never toured in Stockholm, but um, and the idea just came to me, and it was just such a compelling idea of a project to try to do that I couldn't help but try. And so I'm about half finished with it, and it's going to come out in the fall. And um, uh, it, it's uh, and it's not going to it's. I'm going to tour it in the whole thing. I mean, it's going to be a proper release, mm -hmm. but right now I'm just, it's, it's been the most difficult thing creatively I've ever done in my life. For sure. Are you trying to write songs for the corporate church? Are you trying to write songs that just inspire worship? Because worship is, I mean, as, right. a, as a, a stamp on something can mean right. a zillion different yes, things. What does it mean for you in this project? Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested in waiting until the record comes out and letting people figure it out decide for themselves. For themselves. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that is a cliffhanger. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, for, for the dozen more. people who are on the edge of their seats um, <laughs> about what I'm doing next. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm super excited about it. I mean, I, it's again, it's like really has been the most like difficult and challenging artistic thing I've ever done and it's just taken every it's been such a like it's been such a stretch for me and uh, to try to pull off what I'm intending and if I can do it I think it's going to be really special. But I love that you're intentional about these things. I love that you run straight into the things that are challenging and that you take It's my them job. I mean, I take my job pretty seriously. I mean, I'm not um, I always seem to I'm always will provide it for. I always hard as I try to to sell fewer records year after year, I always manage to sell enough to make my living. And um, I mean, I don't really take a lot of consideration into whether or not I'm going to sell records or how I'm going to sell records or who I'm going to sell them to. And I mean, and some bands are really caught up in that and have to be, right? Because they're because of their particular market or their how or maybe their success dictates that they have to mm -hmm. make, make sure they have certain triggers on their albums for radio or for whatever, and their labels have pressure on them. I fortunately have never had any major success. So no one is putting any pressure on me to deliver that again or think that I possibly even could do that. So I am very much off the radar and liberated to do to really trust my instincts and do what I think I what what I feel like is important. Right. With no consideration to record sales or radio or anything else. And so I take my position pretty, pretty yeah. seriously. I think people are starting to realize some people are starting to realize the pressure that's put on artists, oh, yeah. you know. But a lot of people have no clue no. that there is any kind of mold or cookie cutter or anything. Or even just pressures that everyone can identify with in terms of success. I mean you have a little bit and you want more. And I mean, that's why a lot of my friends, I, I mean, so it's internal pressure. It's pressure you put on yourself to do something or keep a certain status or level or popularity or records, whatever it is that becomes your definition of success. I mean, my definition of success on one level would be if I played a show and nobody showed up. Um, if, I, if, I, if I figured out a way to say what I felt like was important so boldly that it wound up meaning no one came to my shows anymore, I didn't sell any more records, that, that might not honestly be a real success for my particular role. Because I'm an equal part singer, songwriter, or agitator. I mean, I really feel like I'm gifted to do it. And there are things that the church, you know, and culture needs to be agitated about. So I, so I, that's where I kind of try to step in. And so if I eventually alienate every every fan I've got, maybe I've done my job and I'm a wild success. I mean, ask Jeremiah what success was for him. He wandered in the desert for 40 years, preaching with no converts. You know, and that was, and he was a wild success at it. So you know, there's, so it depends on, you know, I mean, what. Low to moderate success is all I would wish on anybody because you go further than that and either the people around you or you yourself are going to start to pressure you to keep it going. And I don't have anything to keep going. So. I hope your new music is a mild, moderate success. <laughs> I hope you have low to moderate success with your new album. <laughs> I hope few to several people buy your new record. And that almost no one shows up. And almost no one comes to the shows. I mean, I really feel like if I sold a half million records next year, my career would be ruined. Because I'd be on the radar all of a sudden. Right. And I need to stay off the radar. That's the only way I keep doing what I'm doing. The way I'm doing it. I think you're one of the only people who would flat out say all the things that you say, which I think is great. It's my job. I mean, I, I, it's just doing my job. Yeah. Well, thank you for stopping yeah. by and saying some of them with us. We appreciate it. It's, it. it's nice to, to, to see you as well. Nice to be the purple door. Nice.